Hi, and welcome again to Meter X Success Stories. And I'm Brooke, um, a coach here at Meter X. And today I'm very happy to uh, introduce Dave, who I'll be talking to about his carnivore journey, his journey, his medical health, his health journey. Hi, Dave. How are you? Hi. How are you doing, Brooke? Good. And thank you so much for taking the time to share with our listeners what's been going on for you the past um the past several, the past many years actually, um, and and your journey with carnivore. So, why don't you just start off from I think ten years ago or something? Yeah, well, I can. Uh, I guess my journey started about ten years ago when I went to my uh, primary physician for an annual checkup, uh, and the blood test uh, there revealed that I had a very high hematocrit level, uh, which means my I had too many red blood cells. So the hematocrit is a measure of percentage of red blood in, in your body. So mine was extremely high. Normal is about less than 50. Mine was 68%. So very, uh, very, very high. So to give you a little comparison. It's like uh, instead of, you know, viscosity of the blood, which is normal, mine was more like a sludge, like motor oil or, you know, trying to pump through my body. So he sent me to a hematologist right away and um, he started uh, um, phlebotomies. Phlebotomies is a blood draw to get that blood out of me, get me down to a normal level. While he was doing that, he ran a bunch of tests, which revealed I have something called polycythemia vera, which is a, uh, one of the cancers in a group of cancers called uh, myeloproliferative neoplasms. Uh, my father happened to have one of those, which was probably the worst one, was called myelofibrosis, which is scarring of the bone marrow. Mine is I produce too many red blood cells uh, due to a genetic mutation. Uh, the, so the pathway of the signal to turn the bone marrow on to make blood is stuck in the arm position, and there's no way to shut it off. So... What they do normally for people in my position is they'll start them on a chemotherapy style of drug. Um, or what they'll do is the phlebotomies. They'll just take blood out. As you make it, they'll take it out. So I really wasn't interested in the chemo aspect of it. So I decided to just go with the phlebotomies, right? So I, uh, I, I talked to the doctor about it. We decided that we'll put me on some type of schedule. Uh, for the last 10 years. So when I first started, I was, they had to take a pint of blood out of me for once a week for about 12 weeks. And uh, now I'm settled in on about every four to eight weeks. And that's the way it's been going pretty good now. When you first got that treatment, did you feel a difference, immediate difference when, when blood was drawn? In, I wasn't, you know, I didn't think at the time I was presenting any symptoms of this. Uh, so I was like, really shocked when I was diagnosed and, and mostly because I always led a healthy lifestyle. I've always, uh, I always ate what I thought was a healthy diet at the time. And, you know, for most of my adult life, uh, I worked out all the time. I was involved in sports, martial arts, and, you know, other physical activities, always kept in shape, never had a weight problem. So for me to be diagnosed with this, it was, it was a complete shock to me. And in fact, really, I didn't believe it when I was diagnosed. I, question but they had to do the uh further testing and they confirmed that i do have it and then realizing that my father had uh something very similar uh we we probably i probably acquired the um a genetic mutation i wasn't born with it but i i was predisposed to acquire it like my father probably did so uh, so then it became less of a shock to me that, okay, this is, this is what happened. It wasn't anything I did in my lifestyle that created this problem. It was just uh, something genetic that I had no control over. So from there, uh, you know, I've been experimenting with different diets and things like that. I was uh, probably, I'd say, more paleo, um, you know, leading up to my conversion to carnivore. Uh, I gave up. I, I never was a real big sugar guy. I learned a long time ago in my 20s that uh, sugar is poison. So I always avoided that. Um, the grains, I stopped eating pastas and breads and things like that. Occasionally I have some bread, you know, but other than that, uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't really uh, 
partake of the grains. So, so paleo was a way for you to manage this, this blood disorder. I thought so. You know, I thought so. Um, you know, every, you know, but I still had symptoms. I was still um, fatigue being the main one. Uh, and, and the, re the way I explain that one is, you know, when you really look at what is going on in my body, when they take all that blood out of you, your iron levels fall, they, they drop. Right, so the fatigue really was because of the treatment of removing the blood. Right, yeah, because my iron is so low that my hemoglobin dropped, I became anemic, and now I'm trying to go through life in an anemic state, and they want to keep you there because you're, you know, uh, that's the way to control your bone marrow from making blood. You take one of the ingredients away, which is iron, uh, your, body, your bone marrow has trouble making blood, or at least slows it down. So, can, I, can I ask yeah. you, um, just to help me, me understand, so um, the, dan the biggest danger of this particular cancer or of this, or of this um, compulsion of your bone marrow to be making so much blood, too much blood, too many red bone cells, is that it gets sluggish and then it's a cardiovascular problem? Right, right, exactly. It, it, uh, you, most people that die from this, if it's, they're not treated properly, die of stroke or heart attack due to blood clots. Got so it. that's that's one of the things. That's the reason you want to keep your, your blood um, thin. So um, so by getting your iron so low, what happens is you, I'm still producing red blood cells, but they're they're not normal. They're very small. Uh, they're immature. They're misshapen. And what happens there is you're, you, you end up with a lot of blood cells, but I'm still unable to carry the oxygen that red blood carries because yeah. they're so small. I'm not carrying the amount of oxygen that normal people carry. Plus the fact that the spleen now has to deal with the overabundance of immature cells, um, abnormal cells, and even the normal ones is just, uh, I'm just you know, inundated with them. So the spleen ends up working overtime and then the liver starts working overtime. And, you know, so uh, that's what's going on and inside. Simple, my... So this kind of simple treatment actually causes all these downstream problems as well. Yes, right, right. And, uh, you know, but, you know, it's just something I've been dealing with for 10 years is the fatigue. So, you know, my day starts out pretty good with the energy levels. But uh, by the time I go to bed at night, I'm, you know, like a 90 year old man. So uh, it, it just throughout the day, you know, that happens. But that's why I try to do everything in the mornings. I have a full gym in my garage. I work out almost every day. And, uh, you know, so by the time the, I'd say mid afternoon comes, I start to, you know, wind down my, and, and not tired, not sleepy tired. It's just drained. I'm, I'm physically drained just from, you know, and especially if I have a good workout that day, you know, uh, and I, I do try to have intense workouts. So uh, that will just make me drain a little faster, you know, so. Did they ever use oxygen? Did they ever prescribe oxygen? No, they never, never did. The only thing they tried because I was anemic and fatigue was really bad at one point, they prescribed um, iron supplements. So, uh, that's, yeah, that's which, crazy. <laughs> yeah, which I tried, and uh, and then because I was taking the iron supplements, my hematocrit shot way up again. So I had to stop that and we had to increase the phlebotomies to get me back to normal again. Um, my iron levels is measured as ferritin in the blood. Normal is anything under 22. It's like 22 to 415. So anything under 22 is considered anemic. I'm free. So that's how, that's how anemic I actually am. But my hemoglobin, because I guess I make so many red blood cells, my hemoglobin uh, stays, it's still in the anemic level, but it stays higher. Should you know most people that have what I have, uh, 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 iron levels that I have, uh, wouldn't even be able to get out of bed in the morning. It, it, that's how it would take a toll on them. But you know, yeah. because I make so much blood, it's, you know, it doesn't affect me in that way. So, was aspirin ever prescribed? Yes, actually, yeah, it, uh, low dose aspirin once a day. Yeah, I just questioned my doctor about that too. Well, aspirin was, is such an amazing. Draw, you know, it's, it's it if it has so many amazing benefits to it. Yeah, I mean, yeah, and I question it because uh, a lot of people that have the polycythemia also have high platelet counts, and the high platelet counts are what causes all the uh, problems, you know, with the blood clots and 
uh, the sluggish uh, blood flow and stuff like that. So I don't have a high blood uh, platelet count. My platelet counts are actually pretty normal. So I do have a high white blood count. So I'm also making a lot of white blood. So I was also diagnosed with what they call leukocytosis, which is chronically high white blood. So is that because um, of the taxing of the spleen? That I don't know, and they don't. They you know they don't have an answer for me on that. They only say you know some people make more platelets, some people make more white blood. I they see. all make more red blood, but uh, you know as far as the other ones, you know uh, everybody's different. So this was 10 years ago. So you've been managing this pretty well, I guess, for 10 years on the palio. So, so, so here, brought you over to the <laughs> carnivore side. Well, here's, here's what happened about three years ago. Uh, I, I was just going through some YouTube videos and I came upon the Joe Rogan. You probably heard this a million times. Came upon the Joe Rogan interview with Sean Baker. Uh, and, uh, when I first saw the title about something about, you know, a uh, man who only eats meat. So it intrigued me. So I watched some and I'm think when I first started watching, I go, man, that's crazy. That's just crazy. <laughs> uh, so, but I, you know, I watched the whole thing. And by the end of it, I was very intrigued. I was like, he, he really makes a lot of sense. And, uh, and then I started looking into it more and found, you know, people like Kelly Hogan and others that have been doing it for over 10 years. And I'm like, that, there's got to be something to this thing because if, uh, you know, if, if all the naysayers and all the fear mongers out there, you know, tell you, oh, you got to cut down on your meat, and beef especially, uh, they should be dead, right? So not only are they not, they're, they're thriving. And uh, so I started really digging into it a little more and started doing some research on it. You know, I'm not a researcher. I just, you know, gather information on it. And I was pretty convinced that um, this is something to give a try to. So I was scheduled in that December to go in for a total shoulder joint replacement because I just couldn't get my shoulder working. And uh, I tried everything in the world, physical therapy. I tried a lot of my own stuff, stretches and whatnot. I just couldn't get it. Uh, back to normal. So uh, it was just too well damaged. So we had to schedule a shoulder replacement. That was December, July. I decided to pull the trigger on the carnivore diet and uh, started, I figured I'd start with 30 day. So I went 30 days. Of course, the first two weeks is there's a, there's a transition and, you know. Excuse, did you have a digestive transition? Not everyone yeah. has that, but. but yeah, anyway. that's what I had. Yeah. It, and it wasn't bad. It, I mean, cause my diet wasn't bad to begin with. So, uh, but I was changing my, you know, the way I, I look at it is my, my microbiome was set up for a certain way of eating a certain type of diet, which, which included vegetables and fruits. Um, so when I took those out of the equation, you know, the microbiome had to make an adjustment. And anytime you have a microbiome adjustment, you're going to have a digestive issue. So uh, I ended up with, you know, some di diarrhea and stuff like that. It wasn't bad, though. And I didn't feel bad from it. I didn't have bloating and all that stuff. So I got through about two weeks, took to resolve. And, uh, and then the next two weeks, uh, I started feeling really good. So um, my energy was better. And, uh, and I, I just, you know, decided to continue after the 30 days. So it even brought me all the way up to the surgery, which is in December. And I had the total replacement done. And uh, just to make a long story short, my recovery went really, really well. Doctor told me I was like a model patient because I healed up so well, it, you know, so fast, so well. I was working out within like uh, just a few weeks. I started doing some workouts. Uh, you know, so he was he was definitely impressed. I never told him what I what I did, but you know, but uh, he you know, so that well, was a good he, sign. He that you were already paleo probably at one point. He you know, doctors never ask you what you eat. Oh, they, okay. they don't ask you about your diet. They yeah, never, so, especially like, right. That especially specialists. They you know, I would love it. I would love to go to a doctor one day and they look at you and go, "What's your diet like? What do you eat?" You know, it's like. They don't. They don't. They're. They just look at numbers and you know, look at the lab tests and make a decision from there. But uh, yeah, so so you know, that was a good sign for me that carnivore diet's working. Plus, 
my fatigue started to get better, you know, um, that was uh, improving. And even though my ferritin levels, the iron levels were still coming back extremely low, I was still getting all the phlebotomies. Um, my, my ferritin level was like three to five, but, but yet my hemoglobin all of a sudden kicked up and it was from like, so anything under like 12.2 or something under that you're anemic anything over that, you're, you're in a low normal range. So I went from anemic to a low normal range uh, without, and all I did was switch to a carnival diet, which I decided to eat mostly beef. So I probably eat about two pounds of beef every day. Uh, I do incorporate some pork and things like that. Okay, this might be a good time to insert what, this question of what were you eating you know, I, I know what a paleo diet is, but but there's right. still a, a range and some of our listeners might not know what that, what you, well, we don't know what your paleo diet was. So what were you eating? Right. I was eating, I never, I never didn't eat meat, but I was eating probably more chicken than anything else. Uh, I was eating vegetables. I was eating salads with, you know, with dressing. I was eating, um, I wasn't eating bread or grains. I was eating fruit. I was making uh, fruit and vegetable smoothies with kale and all that stuff. So you're um, eating kale, you're eating probably sweet potatoes. Sweet potatoes, yeah, yep, all that. Uh, white potatoes, sweet potatoes, you know. So anything, anything, you know, and as a vegetable that I liked, I would eat. Were you eating nuts and seeds? Oh yes, I was eating nuts. I was snacking, that was my snacks, nuts, which uh, yeah. mostly cashews, <laughs> so. You weren't eating beans, but you were eating nuts. Yeah. Uh, no, I eat beans. I, I eat, eat beans too. Okay. Too. So, yeah, actually. Yeah, beans too. You had all the big yeah. all the foods. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, not a lot. I, I'm not a, I never really enjoyed beans much at all. So, uh, so I, but I'd have it once in a while. I, I didn't, it's not like I gave it up, but. Um, and when you switch to um, following a carnivore way of eating, you just dropped all the plants and just did it very simply at the first, right away. First day, first day, I gave it all up. And that's probably why I had the issues I had, you know. That's all right. How, awesome. did you, how did you feel after day two or three? How were you feeling? Well, I, I wasn't feeling bad from it, you know, the, uh, with the digestive issues. It just, you know, it, it was just a difference in my, you know, uh, bowel movements and, and things. Yeah. But were, were you noticing? Bad after you ate meat and you didn't eat those beans and nuts and, yeah. and, kale and yes. um, how you, how that felt. <laughs> oh, I had no guess. It was like after, after that two weeks went by and the microbiome made, made their transitions. Uh, I, you know, now I'm not, I don't need that microbiome to break down all the vegetables and fruits and create all that gas. So I, you know, the, no bloating, uh, no, virtually no gas still today. And, you know, Virtually have no gas. Yeah, it's yeah. Amazing. It's nice, huh? That's nice. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah. And so it brings you now to, um, so now it's been th like almost three years, and and so you, your labs weren't a huge difference, but the way you feel is a big difference. Yes. What I heard yeah, um, I I definitely feel uh, that my energy levels have gone up, so. I, you know, I mean, I was at a point where I wouldn't leave the house. It, it was, I didn't have the energy to go down to Charleston and walk around Charleston. Um, uh, a guy, my neighbor next door has a boat. I, you know, I tried going fishing with him a few times. I just couldn't, I, you know, we had to cut the trip short. I just had zero, and at my energy levels, my battery ran low very fast. So, but since I switched to the carnivore and eat more beef, um, my, you know, the fact that my hemoglobin is up means my energy levels are up and, uh, that, that seems to give me a little more energy that sustains me more longer through the day. Uh, yeah. I'm still dealing with fatigue. I still, you know, didn't, didn't resolve it completely, but, uh, I improved my quality of life and that's, that's the most important thing. For me. Are the phlebotomy treatments the same, the same occurrence, the same frequency? Yeah, I, I go... Every four weeks, I go to the, to the uh, doctor's office and get my labs done. And if 
the hematocrit level is above 45, then they take a pint of blood from me. If it's under 45, they uh, let me go. So this last time, uh, it actually came down to 42, which is unusual for me. So they, uh, you know, I didn't need one, but I'll go back in four weeks again. And uh, we'll see where we're at. I mean, I, I went, I'd say about a year and a half ago, I went six months without a phlebotomy. Wow. I don't know what, I have no idea why. And Wow, so it's like maybe regulating itself. Yeah, I mean, but, you know, it's like I asked the doctor, you know, what's going on? I, my concern was it's progressing because when progress, when your bone marrow starts to scar, that's going to slow down the blood making procedure, you know? So, you know, so that's like a concern for me because that's what my father had. Yeah. So he, I asked, I asked, the doctor, am I progressing or is it, uh, you know, what's, what, why all of a sudden after 10 years, six months, I go without a phlebotomy. So he's, well, I think the, your, we finally got your iron down lower enough to stop your body from making that much blood. And I, I, I said, no, nah. I was like, my iron's been lower. My iron has been to a point where it's undetectable. Yeah. So, no. I mean, he, but he didn't have an answer for me. They, this is a rare cancer. They really, they're still learning about it. They don't know a whole lot about it. And they can tell in the blood draw itself about fibrin, whether fiber is, whether scar tissue is building up in the marrow. That's something that they can no, tell. That, no, I would need a bone marrow biopsy for that. So I haven't had yet. Okay, so that's not something he was concerned about. That, it, that he, it, he looks for other signs, I guess. There, you know, I mean, he does. I mean, that blood test they give me every eight weeks I want to see him. Uh, they, it, there's a lot in there, and they, they, there's certain things he's looking for that would show progression, and that's what I'm always asking him. Am I showing any red flags coming up, so, you know, showing progression? Nope. Every, every, every eight weeks, everything seems to be about, about the same. I mean, that's just it. We, we know a lot, but we don't, but it's hardly a little compared to what we don't know. So oh, God. there's so many ways the body can correct itself with the right, right nutrient profile. That's amazing. And I've always, I've always been of the mindset since my twenties that uh, I, if I get, if I get sick, I'll fix it with food. Uh, I'm not going to fix it with medicine. I don't, you know, I'm 67 years old now, you know, I was 57 at the time. So, you know, I'm, I'm one of the few around my group, my friends, and everything, I take no medication. I take nothing, you know. Good for you. I don't have high blood huge. pressure. That's huge. Yeah, yeah. The, the, my cholesterol is elevated, but, you know, not to a point where, you know, it's, it's dangerous. It's slightly elevated. It's not, and, and even if it was high, I wouldn't care. It's, I don't have inflammation. That's yeah, your triglycerides are probably low. Right. They're, they're on the low side. The, uh, you know, but my HDL is low also for some reason. I don't know why, uh, but it's always been regardless. Uh, whenever I've gotten it tested in the past, it's always been on the low side. And uh, I, I don't know if that's an iron thing or what. So, uh -huh. you know. right. so what, um, so what do you eat now? What's your typical day or typical few days of eating? My typical day is I intermittent fast. So I'll eat, you know, my last meal is usually five, six o'clock at night. I don't eat anything after that. Uh, and then I get up, uh, I will have a cup of coffee. I still like my coffee. And then I uh, will go out to the gym. I'll work out, come in. And I wait till about 11, 11 o'clock to, uh, to have my first meal, which will consist of a hamburger, and a piece of uh, breakfast sausage that I make myself. I do all my own, I grind all my own meat, make my own sausage, I make hot dogs. Uh, you know, I was a butcher in my past life, so. Oh, nice, I that's great. <laughs> so, so I can, you know, I, I buy whole ribeyes from Costco. I cut them into steaks. And uh, okay. so, I, I, so I usually eat around 11 and then I don't get hungry till about five or six again. And uh, I'll usually have a steak. Okay, so I heard beef. I didn't hear no. eggs. I heard coffee. Do you put cream in your coffee? I did. Heavy cream. Heavy so, cream. You, so there was some dairy I, and beef. And do you oh. eat eggs? Uh, I do eat eggs. Not, not every day. Um, but, so as far as dairy goes, I drink uh, raw milk. So I found a local yeah. farmer 
yeah, local farmer here has it. So I drink a gallon a week of that. That's, uh, a, that's, that's awesome. Yeah. Well, and I'm, you know, of course. I'm all about the raw milk. That's great. Right. Yeah. Of course, you drink it. Yeah. It's. I don't, I've, drink, I've drank it more recently. You know, there's been times I haven't drank milk, but um, I've, I've embraced it again, again, recently. And yeah, raw milk. I mean, that's, it's great stuff. I, and that's even after I watched a documentary on on, on raw milk, and uh, it was they were killing it. I mean, uh, it, the, you mean the they were bias, saying how bad they were saying how bad it was, how, or something? how bad it was. That the bias that that was coming out of that documentary was just incredible. And I've been I've been drinking a gallon a week for uh, over six years now, and <laughs> I have never ever had an issue. And, uh, so, that's medicine right there. Yeah, yeah, that's how I look at it, you know. And, uh, so, you know, I'm, a, you know, I'm also, you know, I'm working out, uh, you know, almost every day. You know, I do strength training and I do hit training and um, cardio training. Um, you know, so I'm, I'm trying to get a lot of workouts in, but I'm, I'm also finding, like before I was carnivore, I was having a really hard time putting muscle on. So. Um, and, you know, of course, I'm, I'm just, I attribute, when you have this blood cancer, you just, you attribute everything to the blood cancer. Oh, it's because of the blood cancer. Oh, you know, I'm not feeling good. I must be the blood cancer. You know what I mean? So uh, I got out of that mindset and I just started really, you know, focusing on uh, trying to get myself bigger, um, you know, healthier, put more muscle on. So I've been, you know, changing up my workouts and uh, I'm experimenting, I experiment with experiment with myself on everything. So my workouts, my diets. So I'm always a guinea pig for myself. So I'm trying to uh, figure out the best way to put muscle on without putting fat on. And I think carnivore is probably the best way to do that. It's, and it's been working for me. So, you know, I, when I first went carnivore, that first two weeks we were talking about, I lost 10 pounds with, with uh, you know, because I was flushing out. And I lost 10 pounds and uh, I ended up gaining that back in about uh, two months. Yeah, uh, probably. And, and then gained from there. Uh, but I, I think, you know, I would say it's mostly muscle that I was able to put on, which I haven't been able to put on in the past. Good for you. Yeah. So, so you're eating beef and dairy and some eggs and some do you eat, you eat some pork? Yeah, I make my own pork sausage, so. Uh -huh. yeah. you, you I make my own hot dogs, which is pork and beef. And uh, you can find good, um, good pigs, good pig, good pork around. I don't, you know what? That's one of the one I probably could, but I don't. I, there's a farmer's market I could go buy that better stuff, but it's so expensive. You know, and I am on a fixed yeah. income, so it's hard. But so I, you know, so I buy the I buy the uh, whole ribeyes from Costco. I buy yeah. the pork butts from Costco when I make the sausages. Um, chickens, you know, uh, just, just whatever I, I can get. I'll, I don't eat a lot. I, you know, it's funny. When I went to Carnivore, I lost my taste for, for pork. I lost my taste for chicken. chicken yeah. It's, I, I used to love it. And uh, now, like, spare ribs, which I used to love, and I, I'm, it just doesn't have the same effect on me. It's like no, it's my not. body I mean, only, yeah. only wants beef. Yeah. yeah, ruminants, you know, they're – the magic of the rumen and, and the human diet is just a wonderful combination. Yes. Yes. So, you know, and, uh, you know, and I've, I've listened to all the debates about grass fed versus, you know, grain fed, um, you know, and, and actually my son is in the business where he sells beef. Uh, he, he works for a company that sells to restaurants and all that. So he gets all the best stuff. Doesn't right. give it to me, but he gets, he gets all the best <laughs> stuff. But, well, uh, I, think, I think that those those things make a big difference, especially with pork and chicken. But you know, we get a lucky break with the ruminant animal. It does. It, does think, that yeah. for us. It, ch it just changes things up for us. Right, and and you know, you know the the people that say, "Oh, you should only eat grass fed beef," uh, you know, referring to the fact that corn is, you know, is, is GMO corn. It's this, it, but. Their ruminants are also eating what we can't eat, like grass and things that are highly toxic to humans. But they're able to weed all, they're able to process that with three stomachs and, the, and then produce muscle that we eat. So why can't we do that with the grains and the corn too? Right? 
you know, we're not getting well, that. Yeah, the, the, ruminant, the toxins. The ruminant can. The pig can't, but right. the ruminant can. Oh, yeah. the pig can't. No. Yeah. No, okay, they're That's monogastric, true. but it's so great yeah. about beef. And I mean, we're so yes. fortunate to to um, live with, you know, God bless the animals. Yeah, well, <laughs> it keeps it keeps us healthy, you know. Those poor vegans haven't figured it out yet. God bless the vegans too. So so um <laughs> So you're, it sounds like it's working really well for you. It sounds like you eat pretty, a, a nice solid diet that doesn't have to, that actually doesn't even um, have to vary very much. It doesn't sound like you have cravings or something. It's the easiest diet I have ever done in my life. It's, yeah. there's nothing easier than cooking a hamburger and cooking a steak. That's pretty much what I eat. Yeah, cooking a ribeye. Oh, do you eat orchid? Uh, meats like liver. I kidneys. just, I well, the, the one thing I was eating uh, canned cod livers. I was, mm -hmm. I would eat about a can, a can a week on that, just to get, you know, I, and I don't even know if it's doing anything. I just, you know, everything you hear about with fish oils and things like that, and uh, how nutritious the liver is. And I don't like beef liver. I don't like canned liver. I don't like huh. chicken livers. Um, but what I just did, I bought beef liver, frozen beef liver. And because I grind all my own meat, I bought chuck roast. So I cut up the chuck and the liver, ground it all together. In fact, I just had that last night. And then I put a couple eggs in it. So I have the beef, the liver, the eggs, uh, and then whatever seasonings I put in. There. Perfect. That's the perfect way to get your liver in there. Yeah, and I just started that, actually, just this uh, last week. So we'll, we'll see. Maybe, maybe that'll help uh, also because there's iron in liver. So it's another good way to get iron in your body. I mean, there's just so many, you know, liver's like a multiple, a multiple vitamin. There's just so much there. Yeah, yeah. So, and I, I always wanted to incorporate it. I just, and I've tried, you know, I tried eating fried liver a couple of times and I just it couldn't do it. I didn't like it. And, uh, you know, so, but, uh, you know, I'm hearing also that there's a debate about that as well. You know, there's a do debate. we really need organ meats or do we not need organ meats? And one of the arguments, and I think Dr. Baker even, you know, pointed this out was, you know, when, you know, when cavemen were hunting mammoth, you think they went for the liver? No, they went for the muscle meat. That's, that's where the flavor is. So. Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, I mean, it's a debate. I mean, I think that, it is, yeah. you know, some indigenous people would say, you know, would save the liver for pregnant women and maybe young yeah. children or. Right. Um, and it, and back then it had to be instinctual. It had to be an instinct to eat that. Because um, you know we they don't they didn't have science back then to tell them oh this this has this in it and this has that in it and you need this it was your your body told you what you wanted what that's you need that's true to eat. although right. I I have to say I I feel a big difference Do you? I, the days that I eat liver Do you? oh okay well that's good yeah. to hear because uh, yeah yeah because I am definitely incorporating it now so. but I really like, I've never not liked it right. So, you know, I think, I think the abhorrence of something also tells us something. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna stay aware of that. I'm gonna, I'm going to try to see if I do feel a difference from it. And, uh, yeah, check that out. And also, but, I, and I do, I do respect uh, the body's like abhorrence of something. If, if, some, if someone really hates uh, the taste of something, I think that there's a message there too, so. Yeah. I, yeah, that's great that you're staying uh, uh, just, awake and aware of all that stuff. Of yes, all the yeah. chatter. Yeah, I try, I try, I try to keep up on all that, and uh, you know, I, you know, I follow, I, I follow Dr. Baker's videos every day. He's always got some great. updates coming, and you know, he's great, man. He, he really, he's the one that uh, I, I'll credit him for changing my life because he, he's the one that, that got me aware of it, and then. Uh, was pushing people to try that 30 day challenge. And yeah. uh, that's kind of what got me going on it. And uh, he's, a, he's, like a back. Everyday, he's like a, I call him an everyday hero. Yeah. You know, he's just like, and, you know, and just then, do and your push ups, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I love, I love the fact, cause I, I have a rowing machine as well. And uh, so, you know, just following him, I, you know, see his workouts and, and he was breaking in, and I, because I, I row, I know how hard this is. Breaking at his age, uh, breaking world records with a 500 meter row, and the and the 
the numbers he was hitting on that, and I've tried, I've tried to, you know, do really good on that, and I don't come close to, to his his numbers. So, you know, I, I understand how hard that is, and, and then the effort it takes for him to do that. You know, very impressive guy, and, and uh, so he he has a lot of credibility with me. Um, I follow a few other people, and you know, I've seen some that you know that that they uh, they lose credibility and uh, with, with things, you know, when I dig a little deeper on them. But uh, now, Dr. Baker is definitely high up on the scale of credibility with me anyway, so. Yeah, he's uh, great. Uh, do you utilize MeetRx meetings at, at all? I, I see him on, I don't go on them, but I, uh, I watch them on YouTube. Yeah. Uh, there's somebody interesting that he's interviewing uh, yeah. that I, I want to learn more about. I'll, uh, I'll watch it learn from it. I'm always trying to, I'm always looking for things on YouTube to, to educate me. So. Very cool. It sounds like you're really managing your life and your health and, and just being proactive and you're on it. It's great. Yeah, it I'm, sounds like I'm, you're, I don't know if reversing is the, more like living with and managing your body and what your body does or has tendencies to do and, right. and taking care of it. Yeah, and it's not like I'm not like your typical person that went carnivore that had, you know, a lot of metabolic issues, you know, pre-diabetic and things. I've always been healthy. I've always yeah. never been on medication, never had any issues, never, no kidney problems, no, no diabetes, no high blood pressure. I never had to be on medication, always worked out. So I was always a healthy guy. But uh, carnivore, just it, that took me to another level. So, uh, and it opened my eyes to a lot of things and, and how long we've been misled about the whole fat oh uh, yeah you know, and the, can know, i ask body. you so this blood disorder did they always call it a cancer a blood cancer no actually no, they, they did not in fact, in fact when when i was diagnosed with it it was called a disorder yeah so it was, uh, you know we had mpn myoproliferative neoplasms and it was mpds back then myoproliferative disorders so uh it wasn't until I think 2008 that they, uh, no, not 2008. Uh, it was after, I was diagnosed in 2011. So it was after, after that, I believe, that uh, they finally started calling it a cancer. And then uh, when it's called a cancer, it falls under all this SOD, all this standard of, SO, standard of care. Yes. That yes. you can only do these things for cancer. Yeah. Well, doesn't and then that, doesn't that hamstring the physicians a little bit? It also uh, it, it gives them more of an ability to get funding for clinical trials. For, I see. Uh, clinical trials all all revolve around pharmaceuticals. So, which I'm I'm really not interested in in doing. So, I am I am actually uh, one of the pharmaceutical companies that makes the drug that most people are on. Uh, I actually they actually contacted me and wanted my story, uh, even though I don't take their drug. So I give them credit for that. And they, they did a whole little documentary on me uh, as far as my story went and, you know, how I'm dealing with uh, coping oh. with the polycythemia. And, uh, like so recently? They, did they do that recently? That was, that was about three years ago. Uh, that was before I went carnival. Yeah. So, uh, so in that video, you'll see me making a uh, I talked about making a vegetable a fruit shake, you know, uh, I was cutting up a chicken, you know, they had that on the video uh, and I've changed since then. So, uh, so now they, they were just here a couple of weeks ago and uh, did another video with me, but it's for the doctors and how I'm dealing with some of the symptoms. And all that. So, and, and your results are so much better now with this change the past three years. Yes, definitely. I, you know, I wish they'd come around and ask me again because uh, I tell them how I changed my diet. You know, they're aware of it now. But, um, uh -huh. I do talk to them all the time. I'm part of a, uh, I'm part of a peer program. It's called Peer Connections. And people that are newly diagnosed with this cancer uh -huh. uh, contact this group, this organization. And then they, uh, because I'm part of, I'm a, considered a peer they connect them with me and I talk to them about, you know, cause they're, they're scared, you know, they're, they're very scared about what, what the future brings for them. And as I was, when I was diagnosed, they didn't have anything like that back then. So I'm part of that program now. So I've talked to uh, quite a few people about 
And I, you know, I don't push the, the carnivore diet. I don't tell anybody you need to do this or you should do, do this. I tell them what I do. I tell them it helps. And if they ask, I tell them, I always go, go to meet RX because you, you're not going to find any more information that's on there. That's, that has everything you need. So I'll send them to that website and uh, tell them if, that, if that's hey. what you're interested in, there you go. That's great. You're in a position to help people directly with this. That's awesome. Yeah. And share <laughs> what you're yeah. doing. You know, how, what is the typical age of diagnosis for this disorder? In the, uh, I would say usually later in life, it's uh, late 50s, 60s. Some people don't get diagnosed till their 70s. Um, I was 57 at the time, which is, you know, kind of right around the beginning of when people start getting it. It's when you're, you're, you're that's when you acquire the mutation. That's uh, usually there. There are some young people that, that are dealing with this in their 20s that have uh, acquired the mutation early. But uh, for me, it was in my late 50s. Amazing. So people, it's not something that people don't die of it quickly. And like you no, said, no, you it can, affects yeah, their you cardiovascular can. Health, health or stroke. Yeah, exactly. You can, you can uh, if, if it's managed properly, you can live a long life. It's, it's, you can, people die with this disease instead of dying from it. Right. Uh, the, the, the concern that for me is the progression. So this could progress to the myelofibrosis that my father had, which will definitely shorten my life or acute leukemia, which is another progression of this disease where your white blood count comes out of control and you so it, can so it can often progress. Well, it, it's a, is it a progression to leukemia or is it just another dysfunction of the bone marrow? They, they call it a occurs. progression, but yeah, it's a progression. But I think what happens is you switch from making red to white. And, you know, and red blood cells can be managed. The white blood cells really can't. You can't, you can't do phlebotomies and manage that. You have to definitely have to go on a chemo therapy. Yeah. But, uh, you know, acute leukemia is pretty bad. So, yes. you know. and, and I'm wondering if uh, chemotherapy for your condition, whether that even prolongs life, does it even prolong life? There's, yeah, there, I mean, there's different theories of thought on that where, um, you know, some people, some doctors, some specialists in this field say that if you're only doing phlebotomies, the chances of progression are better. Uh, and I asked my doctor about that as well. And he said, there are absolutely no studies that show that. So there's no clinical trials or anything that have proven that. That's just a theory on that doctor's part. Um, so there's still a debate out there. They're still learning about this. They, you know, they're they're conducting a lot of clinical trials. But like I said, it's more for the pharmaceuticals uh, trying to figure out what drug works the best. And you know, so far, ten years in, and uh, I'm doing pretty good with just phlebotomies. And are there? Do you know of people who have actually that that it just goes away? That this in that oh, it this doesn't go away. There's no cure. Yeah. But that it doesn't is, go. I don't mean cure. I mean, does it like yours is cut? It's cut down considerably. Um, yeah, I mean, um, it's highly I, unusual. I, I, yeah, I mean, there are people that are taking the drugs that don't need the phlebotomies anymore, so they're they're, it's it's managed, it's under control. Uh, they. Still experience the same symptoms and whatnot that I that I experience with the fatigue, mostly night sweats, uh, itching after you take a shower, things like that. A um, couple of other minor things that I you know I don't really focus on, but uh, there's the there's really no way to stop your bone marrow from making the blood, you know, slow it down with medication, um, or you could just take the excess out like I do and uh, deal with that. So so far, you know, I've been managing it for 10 years this way. I don't, I could seek out another specialist in the field, but uh, what I'm finding is, is the specialists uh, will, will want you on that medication because that's that's what all the clinical trials are showing to be on medication on that medication. And, uh, and it's all chemo drugs and I'm not interested in that right now. I mean, I, I may have to go that route eventually if uh, things start getting out of control, but uh, I'm I'm pretty confident now with the way I eat and uh, work out and stuff that I can I can manage this pretty for a long time. And it sounds like your bone marrow has slowed down with that. It's not doing 
it, it, it comes and goes. It's okay. weird. It's uh, yeah. I mean, I've gone from having phlebotomies every two weeks to three weeks to four weeks now, eight weeks. It's and then I went that six month stint, and uh, now I'm back to every four weeks to eight weeks, and uh, okay. you know, yeah. So <laughs> we'll see. It's okay. uh, yeah. I'm never. I'm always surprised. I can't. People ask me, "Do you know when you need a phlebotomy? Do you know? Does your body tell you when?" You, I'm like. I feel no different uh, whether I need one or I don't. I, there, there have been times where I tried to, you know, try to make that correlation with the way I was feeling, where I my fatigue was really bad, and, and I'm like, oh man, I probably need a full body. And I go in, no, you're good, you don't need one. So, I, you know, I've several times, you know, and then a couple times I went in, and I felt really good, I didn't have as much fatigue, and I go, oh man, you shot up. Beautiful body. You know? right. Surprise. Yeah. So I can't, you know, can't figure it out. So, and and you know, everybody I talk to, everybody seems to be different as far as you know, the treatment. And you know, they they're well, they're either on a chemo drug and they need phlebotomies every maybe twice a year. So people like me that are just doing phlebotomies every four to ten weeks or whatever it might be. I would guess, I I'm, I I was I suspect that if you're on the chemo drug that you might need other drugs for the side effects that the chemo drugs give you yeah i mean depending on the side effects uh you know i i haven't really looked into that that much but i know from following the social media sites with the people with this cancer uh there are people that have some really severe side effects from it and have to come off of it and then go on to a different one uh so and then there are people where you know if i comment on uh, i've been doing phlebotomies for 10 years and they, they, a lot of them say, my doctor never even gave me that choice. He just told me I need to be on this drug, you know, and put me on the drug right away. So and I was like, well, luckily mine didn't. So I, uh, I had a choice. Very good, Dave. Yeah. Sounds like you're rocking it. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I feel pretty good. I, uh, that's why I, I, you know, I put that post on the uh, Carnivore Tribe. Uh, I was proud of the fact that I turned 67 and was able to do 67 box jumps. So, uh, wow, that's awesome. So, and I, you know, so I, you know, put that out there, and that's when, uh, you know, you know, our ex contacted me. Somebody else contacted me uh, for an interview. So, um, yeah, so it was, you know, it's it's good if I can, you know, at least help people or people that have cancer, you know, uh, have a have a choice. Uh, and want to look at what's helping me and uh, you know and I can express the fact that carnivore diet switching to that way of eating has, has definitely helped me um, it most people uh, especially with cancer have have that embedded in their head that you need a balanced diet you should be on a plant-based diet and I don't know how many times I've seen those comments on those sites where uh, Everybody's like, well, what, you know, they'll put a question out. What kind of diet should I be on with, with this PV? And the answers that come out are just mind boggling. Uh, you know, they're like, well, you can't eat iron. You have to stay away from beef, especially, uh, and don't eat kale, uh, but you should be on a plant based diet. And, uh, you know, it's like, uh, it's just the, the misinformation that, is, that flows out there. So that's not just. That site. That's the 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 uh, at the organization that I did the video with. They put on there was they just recently put something on there about the uh, the type of diet that's best for this cancer. And first thing I read was you should you should be on a plant based diet. And yeah, I'm sure I like, they. Oh, I want to pull my hair out. <laughs> yeah, I mean they videotaped you, so I'm sure the video the parts that they're going to show are the parts that you're cutting up the kale. Yeah. <laughs> Well, they, I don't think they're going to show because I was cutting up a chicken too. So they're probably uh, probably not going to show that. But they, uh, I mean, they, it, they're they still going with that. You know, you got to oh, eat your oh, yeah, fruits, absolutely. you got to eat your vegetables and it's cut all, down on your about, meat. Um, yeah, cut it's down all about, on your fat. Yeah. yeah. It's all about uh, taking animals off of the menu in general, animal foods. That's that's what they're trying to do. And, yeah. I don't I don't see it really happening because uh, I, I think there are too many people in this country that love their beef, uh, especially their steaks and their hamburgers. And I, uh, 
And now they're coming out with this, uh, you know, possible burgers and, you know. Yeah, some back, lab, back some crap. slop, some kibble slop yeah. for you. For right. Sure. It's all about yeah. the, it's all about the, the profitable kibble slop. <laughs> it's, yeah. So, so corporations can make a ton of money. They don't care about you. They, they really don't. They're looking to make it, make a, a buck and uh, people and, and, People that rely on corporations uh, to dictate their health, they're in a lot of trouble because it hasn't worked so far. Yes. Over the years, we've been misled so many times. That, uh, and, and even though that whole uh, fat, saturated fat causes coronary artery disease and uh, leads to heart attacks, and uh, it has been debunked so many times that there are still doctors out there telling you to eat low fat. Yeah. And that just I, I had a, uh, a whole it's, cardio it's workout. It's not even about low fat. It's really about the kinds of kinds fat. Of fat. Yeah. Right. And I, and I just I just had, because I went, my last visit to my primary, uh, I have what they call PVCs. My heart, I've had it for many years. I, my heart just skips a beat, you know, and I can feel it. And for some reason, I was feeling it a little bit more. Maybe I was just thinking about it more. But uh, she put me on an EKG in the office. And it came back just slightly abnormal. So she sent me for a uh, echocardiogram, a sound, uh, ultrasound. Uh, and it, she saw something in there, uh, slightly abnormal. So she set me up with a cardiologist who put me on a stress test. Uh, that showed something just slightly abnormal. And she's like, normally I wouldn't dig any further, but uh, we just want to make sure there's no blockages. So she sent me for a a whole cardio, uh, cardiovascular uh, CT scan. Um, and that came back, no blockages, uh, strong heart. Okay. Uh, injection function is, is, is good. Uh, so, I, I mean, it all came back good, which makes me feel good because, you know, because, you know, with the carnivore diet, I eat, I eat a lot of fat and stuff. Um, and, you know, my uh, LDL is a little high. So, but they keep that fear in you. So you're always, you know, just keeping it in the back of your mind. You know, am I really doing the right thing? And, you know, uh, yeah, and, and then and you're MDs, always worried. You know, and MDs yeah. aren't going to know. They don't, it's not like they were free from all the other industry propaganda that we all got. So. Oh, no, they, yeah. I mean, like, they're being taught by the pharmaceutical company, right? So, you know, their, their first thing they do is push uh, statins on you. And, uh, and even though everything came back great with, with my cardio, with all the scans and all that, because my LDL was slightly elevated, it wasn't even that high, it was just yeah. slightly elevated. She wanted to put me on statins. And I was like, no, I'm not yeah. doing statins. So, she has an insurance company to be, to be concerned yeah, about. Yeah, it's like, oh, they, they just don't get it. You know, it's just, it's, it's yeah. frustrating that, that doctors just aren't coming around. You got to be your own advocate. You got to do your own research, and, and then if if you're too lazy to do that, then uh, you're gonna have a life full of uh, disease, and you know, all of your life is gonna go down quick as you get older. Uh, yeah. You know, well, it's good that you are fix on it. Yeah. So, is your whole family meat based? At not meat, um, animal based, uh, animal foods based. I live with my wife, so she is. She follows it. Uh, my daughter. Well, I posted also on the corner with child because she had such a great result from it. Uh, she went on about two years ago and she was overweight. She was always heavy, especially after she had her kids. Couldn't lose that weight. Um, and, you know, try to try to, you know, she wasn't the most disciplined, but she tried a lot of different diets and nothing really worked. So uh, she saw the results I was getting from the carnivore diet. And I kind of led her to, you know, where she could find out more about it and whatnot. So she started researching a little more and then decided to pull the trigger on it for 30 days. And uh, she liked what she saw too. So she's continued on it. She's not as strict. Uh, she will stray here and there, but, but she also knows when she does, she actually pays the price for it. Because not, not that she gets sick or anything, but things just aren't normal in the digestive area uh, for, for a short time until you go back on it. Yeah, you have to be careful with uh, with plants. Right. Well, to think. Because, yeah, I mean, that microbiome that, that, that used to have for all those vegetables is gone. So now we're all set up for just a meat diet, which, you know, 
So that that gets mostly digested in the small intestine. Yeah. So but I mean, I think there's just some plants that are just going to be more toxic for you. Yeah. yeah. And that's the other thing I learned after I started looking at the carnivore was how toxic plants can be. And, yeah. uh, oxalates and, uh, you know, anti-nutrients. And, you know, what the thing they tell you about plants is, you know, oh, it has all these nutrients in it and this and this vitamins and these vitamins and enzymes and this. Uh, but what they don't tell you is how much of that are you absorbing? How much of that is processed where your body can utilize it? It's not much, you know? It's no, they don't much. tell you anything. It's, it's all about marketing. What's good? <laughs> yeah. Long shelf life, what looks pretty, what looks what's yeah. tasty. Yeah. Right. And then, and then, of course, all the people that are concerned about animals' health and, you know, killing animals, you know, they don't look at the fact that all the animals that are killed in the fields, mice, and, you know, I guess they don't matter, right? They're, they're small animals, so they don't matter. Yeah, just the, the hypocrisy is just... And know, we're animals. We are, yeah. We're animals. Well, I, I mean, come on, we're animals. <laughs> and animals, you know, they get to, yeah. to eat. Yeah, so. I put a post-it somewhere, I said, because some, you know, vegan was uh, berating somebody about, you know, killing animals and stuff. I said, yeah. you know, I said well, maybe, uh, what about all those, you know, she called them beautiful animals. And I said, what, what about all those beautiful animals? that kill other beautiful animals to eat. Uh, yeah, should we convert them to vegan? Yeah, tigers and lions. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, we're, yeah. we're animals. That's, that's, we need that's animals how, to, to live. I'm convinced that, you know, humans evolved on meat. Um, no one's ever going to convince me of anything else because back then, um, that back then the, uh, you know, plants weren't the plants of today. They weren't as available as they are today. So it was just whatever, if meat wasn't available, they, they would go out and try some, eat some berries and things like that to uh, sustain, sustain themselves until they were able to hunt and find meat again. I mean, I'm convinced of that. I don't think, I think all the evidence shows, uh, shows that. But, um, you just can't convince a vegan and they still haven't answered the, the question. Well, if, if we were evolved, if we evolved on plant life, why, why, why is there no B12 in plant life? Why, do, why does that only come in, in animal food? Uh, you know, and then the other one is the stomach acid. Why is our pH stomach acid so low? Yeah. Because we don't need it to, to uh, digest plants. We only need it to digest meat. But we evolved on meat, and that's why our uh, acids, our digestive acids are so strong. It's uh, the it's, infusion of Disneyland in their in their. It life. is. They, they can't answer those questions. And, uh, yeah, of, of Disneyland, of, of no death and no suffering, which, you know, that would be great if life had no death and right. no suffering. Exactly. That would be a wonderful thing, but that's not might, life. That might be in our next life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm but, glad uh, you're in this one at the same yeah. time I am. I'm glad you're in the carnivores <laughs> with me. Sounds like you're doing such a great job. And, and I love that you're in a position to help other people that, that get diagnosed with uh, this disorder, uh, uh, just showing them the way you're managing it. Sounds great, mm -hmm. you're doing great. And thank you for reaching out and, uh, and letting me share my story because it's, yeah. uh, you know, it's, it's something I think people should know that uh, they do have options in life, you know, yeah. uh, that, uh, you know, people that have cancer are afraid to eat meat. And uh, I can share my story like, like here and people with cancer can uh, look at that and say, Oh, there's another option, and it's so, helping him. So, thank you, thank you yeah. for so uh, elucidating the option that you took. It's really yeah. great. Yeah. Thanks for the opportunity. I appreciate it. Carney on. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. <laughs>